Happy Sabbath, everyone, and Happy Sabbath. Um, today, I'm going to present uh, just some of the just some things that I've picked up from uh, studying the Book of Ezekiel. I've been going through the chapters. Uh, I'm in chapter 37 at the moment with a group. Mostly, they're from England. And, uh, and as I've been going through the chapters, I've just sort of been noticing, finding a few things here and there. So I'm entitling, entitling this here study, Gleanings from Ezekiel. We're not just focusing on uh, one chapter or a section or whatever. So it's just we sort of like um, gleanings from here and there throughout the book. And uh, so... It's just sort of a, some of this will be review, uh, some of the things uh, you might be familiar with, and uh, some things, it's, uh, yes, it's um, maybe a few things which are, I've picked up a scene that you might not be familiar with, uh, from Ellen White's writings, and it's just some of it, it's just good to sort of go over what Ellen White says about some of the things as well. There's an Ellen White quote concerning Ezekiel. Uh, so while Jeremiah continued to bear his testimony in the land of Judah, the prophet Ezekiel was raised up from among the captives in Babylon to warn and to comfort the exiles and also to comfort the word of the Lord that was being spoken through Jeremiah. Sorry, to, not to confirm the word of the Lord that was being spoken through Jeremiah. <clears throat> During the years that remained of Zedekiah's reign, Ezekiel made very plain the folly of trusting to the false predictions of those who were causing the captives to hope for an early return to Jerusalem. He was also instructed to foretell, by means of a variety of symbols and solemn messages, the siege and utter destruction of Jerusalem. She says, the last books of the Old Testament show us workers taken from the laborers in the fields. Others were men of high ability and extensive learning. But the Lord gave them visions and messages. These men of the Old Testament spoke of things transpiring in their day. And, I, and Daniel, Isaiah and Ezekiel not only spoke of things that concerned them as present truth, but their insights reached down to the future and to what should occur in these last days. <clears throat> so when we're looking at Ezekiel, uh, where a lot of it uh, has very pertinent, very pertinent uh, to us, to the time that we are living, just like a, a contextual timeline for Ezekiel's prophesying. So from uh, around 700 BC, just before that, we had Isaiah. Joel was preaching then, Samaria was destroyed. Uh, around the time of King Josiah, Zephaniah and Habakkuk, and then Jeremiah began to preach in 627. And um, he overlaps with Ezekiel as well as Daniel. And then we have Haggai and Zechariah near the end of, uh, towards the end of 500 BC. And then later we have uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so chapter one begins with Ezekiel's prophecy at Chebar. So Ezekiel, the morning exile prophet in the land of the Chaldeans, was given a vision teaching the same lesson of faith. So in the context of what she's saying here is, uh, uh, same lesson of faith as Isaiah in the mighty God of Israel. This vision was given to Ezekiel at a time when his mind was filled with gloomy forebodings. He saw the land of his fathers lying desolate. The city that was once full of people was no longer inhabited. The voice of mirth and the song of praise was no more heard within her walls. So when I read this here, I sort of had a Sort of had, because he, he's writing 
he begins his prophesying in 592. In, in Jerusalem, there was still uh, people in Jerusalem at that their time, so I was trying to discern how to understand that what Ellen White's speaking about here. So the city that was once full of people was no longer inhabited, she says. So there was an unspecified number of captive, captives that were taken to Babylon that included Daniel and his three companions in 607 BC. So Jeremiah 52, 28 notes that um, in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, 3,023 were carried away captive. I thought this year number was quite interesting. It's in the seventh year. And the, this year number is the uh, uh, 343rd prime number, which is seven times seven uh, times seven is uh, 343. So just, uh, just something of interest there. And uh, so Josephus, in rounding down the number to the nearest thousand, relates these captives as being taken at the end of Jehoiakim's reign, thus likely being December 598 BC. So Josephus, he writes, the king of Babylon made an expedition against Jehoiakim, whom he commanded to be thrown before the walls without any burial, and made his son Jehoiachin king of the country and of the city. He also took the principal persons in dignity for captives, 3,000 in number, so that's it, running it down, and led them away to Babylon. So Josephus, some things have looked into him. Um, he's not always correct, but uh, I just thought it's certainly worth uh, considering where he's placing these here, uh, 3,000 being taken captive. And then 2 Kings 24, 11, and 14 to 16 states that in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, so that's his just given context there, in 597 BC, he carried away all Jerusalem, all of the princes, and all of the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained, save the poorest sort of the people in the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his officers, and the mighty of the land, those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the men of might, even 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, a 1,000, all that were strong and apt for war. Even them, the king of Babylon, brought captive to Babylon. And uh, Jeremiah 29, 1-2 would suggest that Ezekiel was one of the 10,000 that were carried to Babylon says, now these are the words of the la, of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders that were carried away captives mm -hmm. and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Je Jeconiah or Jehoiachin, the king, the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. <clears throat> so um, I think that's good evidence that uh, these here priests and prophets, so Ezekiel, he was a priest and a prophet. So he would have been amongst these here uh, 10,000. Just a comment, Stephen. Can you hear me? Yes. I don't have my mic in a good place. So. Yeah, so with um, uh, this comment about, uh, uh, because I think that there is um, with uh, Josephus there, uh, there seems to be confusion regarding um, some of the verses in the Bible and why they say this. So I, I'm not really sure about what happened to Jehoiakim, if that's, what actually happened to him. But I think uh, the point is that those captives in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar that are, are carried away, that is going to be in uh, 598. That's going to be probably at the time they begin this siege, right? That's going to last for three months and 10 days. Well, does the siege last that long because 
Jehoiachin was set up as the king by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He's not going to just set him up as king and then begin the siege straight away. No, Jehoiachin's not set up as king by Nebuchadnezzar. Jehoiachin just becomes king because his dad dies. Right, okay. Right, so his dad dies. And, you know, I've struggled with this for a long time, reading all the different sources and different opinions. So um, there, there are a few different opinions. But this one is that uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes against Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim is uh, cast out of the city um, either by uh, people that are pro-Babylonian, uh, like people who don't want the siege to, to happen. Uh, so they throw him out as a sort of an offering uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but then that siege is going to last for three months and 10 days. So that's going to be from uh, December, what, December 8th or 9th till um, March 16th, 597. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of, scholarly uncertainty about these things. Um, I don't know if Ellen White gives us enough information to sort of sort that out that I can find. But that's the way that I take it, is that uh, Jehoiakim, I, I, I've taken the position before that maybe Jehoiakim dies and that's why Nebuchadnezzar comes against Jerusalem uh, to secure uh, the city. But then uh, Jehoiachin doesn't surrender to him, and so then he places Zedekiah on the throne after the siege. But anyway, yeah, uh, Josephus isn't always the best source, just because he's using lots of different sources often that contradict each other. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you. It does uh, say that there was a prophecy concerning Jehoiakim that he would be thrown outside the walls or something, and he would be Buried with the burial of an ass. Um, that, or that he wouldn't be buried in a sense. Uh, he'd be just like thrown out and not buried. Not, I think that's what um, that burial of an ass is. It's just sort of left, left to rot sort of thing. Uh, so although Jer Jerusalem's population had been much diminished, it still had inhabitants at the time of Ezekiel's first vision. It was not until after the destruction of the city in 586 BC, about six years later, when it could be more properly stated that the city what that was once full of people was no longer inhabited. Uh, Ezekiel could potentially be seeing the city uninhabited in his forebodings, inspired by the other prophetic writings of the city's destruction. So maybe he's just sort of seeing it, contemplating the words of uh, other prophets, seeing that it's going to be destroyed and sort of in that in his imagination and his forebodings. So that's just just one way of maybe of explaining what El Might's uh, stating there. But she continues, the prophet himself was a stranger in a strange land where boundless ambition and savage cruelty reigned supreme. That which he saw and heard of human tyranny and wrong distressed his soul, and he mourned bitterly day and night. But the wonderful symbols presented before him beside the river Chebar revealed an overruling power mightier than that of earthly rulers above the proud and cruel monarchs of Assyria and Babylon. The God of mercy and truth was enthroned. Uh, so verses one to three says, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was amongst the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. So the 30th year, some commentaries relate the 30th year to Ezekiel's age, from which a priest uh, would begin to fill, fulfill his sacred duties. As an ordinal count uh, would be a span of about 29 years, but not more than 30. So 30 years prior would take us back to 622 BC, and the 18th 
uh, 19th years of Josiah. So in his 18th year, after the finding of the Book of the Law, a Passover feast is instituted, uh, with Ezekiel's last day being the 10th day of the 7th month in 573 BC, a period of 49 years relating to a jubilee can be ascertained. Uh, the 30th year would seem to primarily relate to the 30th year of this jubilee period. And so this is uh, 622 BC. We have this here time uh, from Josiah's 18th year. Uh, he finds this here book of the law, or well, one of the, the Hilkiah or someone, one of the priests found it in the temple. That's found and then there's going to be, as a result of that, there's going to be a Passover. And uh, we can discern that this is counting uh, Josiah's reign from fall to fall. <clears throat> so uh, the 18th year would be then, this would be like the autumn and this would be the autumn. So uh, this would be the 49th year of that jubilee count, if, according to what Ezekiel is, we seem to be uh, seem to be referencing. And then this year jubilee then would begin on the 10th day, the 7th month. And that would be the, then the 19th year of Josiah. Yeah. So that um, 18th year of Josiah then is a sabbatical year, followed by a jubilee year. Yes. And the uh, I noticed that from the 18th year of Josiah's reign began on the 26th of September in the Julian calendar, 623 BC, and the Passover occurred 220 days later on the 4th of May. So I just thought it's quite interesting that it's uh, 220 days. So reference, referencing uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 3, Elamite says, Behold thy Ezekiel. So she inserts Ezekiel there, that's not me. She says, Art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. So the Lord God favoured Ezekiel the old and experienced servant of the Most High. He was older than Daniel. Daniel was growing in favour with kings and with nobles. He was about to fill the important place of Ezekiel, and yet Ezekiel was not at all envious, but was glad that God was bringing in younger men, Daniel and his fellows, to stand firmly for the honour of God. As these men honoured God, serving him with purity of principle, exalting God above all kings and nobles, Ezekiel gave encouragement to them as a father would to his children. So the upward look says, um, page 83, Daniel was but a youth when carried away captive into Babylon. He was about 15 or 16 years old before he was called a child, which means that he was in his youth. So uh, 623 or 622 BC then would be the approximate years of Daniel's birth if he was taken captive in 607 BC age 15 or 16, as Ellen White there states. So this would make Daniel about 30 or 31 years of age when Ezekiel had his first recorded vision. If Ezekiel was a father to Daniel, then the 30th year has nothing to do with Ezekiel's age and relates purely to a jubilee year in 622 BC. So um, to me, I kind of cleared up that issue of could it relate to Ezekiel being 30? As a lot of commentators would suggest that. Uh, but according to Ellen White, I, I'd imagine that he's certainly at least around 50 to maybe even older. He's going to be like a father in the age to, uh, to Daniel. So that there, uh, where she was quoting, was about thy art wiser than Daniel, was uh, really relating to the, the ruler of Tyre. Uh, but she makes an application there to, uh, to Ezekiel. And uh, this year, 49 year period, just make you see this. So we have uh, this year, Jubilee here from 622 to uh, 
573 BC, and the 10th day of the seventh month there is mentioned in Ezekiel 40, verse 1. And then we can notify that it's 36 years to when Cyrus ascends the throne. And that uh, ends the 70 year captivity, which began in 607, well, that period there. And then it was uh, 34 years from when that captivity began until the end of that, uh, till that their jubilee year in uh, 573. And we can note uh, the, that there was also that jubilee began in the year uh, after Josiah's Passover. And uh, it's then 607 years, which corresponds to this year 607 BC. We have an inclusive count through the close of probation for ancient Israel in 34 AD. So we have a, a date 34 AD and then a span of 34 years as well to the end of that 49. And then uh, we can also note another 36 year period to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that 70 corresponds to the, the 70 year period that we had from 607 to 537. And that there uh, was, the siege actually began um, just before the Passover and uh, in 70 AD. So you can have that Passover being notified at each uh, way mark there at the beginning and the ending. So we have 34, 70 and 607 as dates and spans connected with uh, 49 or 490 years because you have 490 years then. Uh, the 70 weeks beginning uh, in 5, 457 BC and ending in 34 AD. And that's followed by 36 years. And you can note uh, after these 49 years, you have another 36 years uh, and, uh, coming after them. So just a, a structure there. So the, the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity so this is when 592 is when uh, Ezekiel's vision occurs. So it's near the end of uh, Jehoiakim's fifth year, if he was still reigning. And uh, he began to reign in December. I have it there as the 9th of uh, December, 598. And then he is 10 captive 100 days later. And uh, it says three months, 10 days. And so his first year then would begin be counted in the autumn of 597 BC, just uh, for that to, to work. So the fifth day of the fourth month is the 21st of July, 592 BC in the Julian calendar. And this connects, as we know, to Sign of Snow at Midway in Boston with the Midnight Cry in the fifth day of the fourth month in 1844. Um, so Ezekiel chapter one talks about these wheels within wheels and uh, can ask someone else to to, uh, to read what we have here, what Ellen White speaks concerning them, please, a volunteer. In the visions given to Isaiah, to Ezekiel and to John, we see how closely heaven is connected with the events taking place upon the earth and how great is the care of God for those who are loyal to him. The world is not without a ruler. The program of coming events is in the hands of the Lord. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations, as well as the concerns of his church in his own charge. We permit ourselves to feel altogether too much care, trouble, and perplexity in the Lord's work. Finite men are not left to carry the burden of responsibility. We need to trust in God, believe in him, and go forward. The tireless vigilance of the heavenly messengers and their unceasing employment in their ministry in connection with the beings of earth show us how God's hand is guiding the wheel within a wheel. The divine instructor is saying to every actor in his work, as he said to Cyrus of old, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. In Ezekiel's vision, God has had his hand beneath the wings of the cherubim. This is to teach his servants that it is divine power that gives them success. 
He will work with them if they will put away iniquity and become pure in heart and life. Five testimonies, 753, four. Um, read on, please. Next one. God is acquainted with every man. Could our eyes be open, we would see that eternal justice is at work in our world. A powerful influence not under man's control is working. Man may fancy that he is directing matters, but there are higher than human influences at work. The servants of God know that he is working to counteract Satan's plans. Those who know not God cannot comprehend his movements. There is at work a wheel within a wheel. Apparently, the complication of machinery is so intricate that man can only see a complete entanglement. But the divine hand, as seen by the prophet Ezekiel, is placed upon the wheels, and every part moves in complete harmony, each doing its specific work, yet with individual freedom of action. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, as we allow complications, we're under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim. All the complicated play of human events is under divine control. Amidst the strife and tumult of nations, he that sitteth above the cherubim still guides the affairs of the earth. The history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time or place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth to which they themselves knew not the meaning, speaks to us. To every nation and to every individual of today, God has assigned a place in his great plan. Today, men and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is ruling, overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. Um, so I just sort of see there, I'm just sort of, he mentions time, and yes, sort of connected with these here uh, wheels. Uh, so a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire unfolding, enfolding itself, and out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, as for the likeness of their faces. They four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four had the face of an eagle. So, um, the cherubim represent the sky, is what uh, I'm proposing here. Uh, these animals can be seen to represent the sky, or more specifically, the 12 to 12 constellations through which the sun nearly passes through, uh, known as the zodiac. So the zodiac means degrees or steps or a circle of animals. In Job 38, 32, uh, the recently published literal standard version translate what the King James Version calls Mazaroth, as the 12 signs of the zodiac. Uh, it says there, do you bring out the 12 signs in their season? So in Ezekiel 126, we see the firmament above the heads, above their heads of these animals, and above that again, the throne of God, representing that God is above and controlling the heavens with its constellations. Uh, heathen nations and even Israel had burned incense to the sun and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. Uh, so that's the quote from uh, 2 Kings 23, verse 5. So rather than the one who has set his glory above the heavens, which uh, we will find out in Psalm 8, verse 1, thus the symbolism teaches us to look to the one above the heavens rather than which he has created. So the face of the lion has been related to the constellation of Leo, the ox, we can relate that to the Taurus, uh, the man to Aquarius, uh, the water bearer, um, the man to Aquarius, the water bearer, and the eagle uh, to uh, Scorpio. Now, Scorpio is associated with three different animals, the scorpion, the snake, and the eagle. <clears throat> so that's uh, from Wikipedia, uh, if you just Google that on uh, Scorpio. So uh, these are constellations related to astrology and horoscopes, which uh, the Bible we know condemns, but I uh, believe God has his hand in the sort of uh, maybe guiding the naming of these here uh, constellations. 
So as the constellations are ordered, each of the four signs can be found on the perpendicular and therefore represent uh, the whole constellations. So this is uh, where the sun passes through, we go through, uh, I think it normally begins in Aries, I think it's normally the, the time of the year, and then it goes uh, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, so forth. And we find each of these here animals can be uh, re represented on each uh, of the perpendicular. So there you get two other constellations then in between. So I have some thoughts uh, concerning Christ uh, coming at midnight as a lion. So Ezekiel in seeing the vision with uh, the four living creatures on the fifth day of the fourth month, uh, which equates to midway or midnight in the summer of 1844, with the sun being in the constellation of Leo at that time, uh, we could link the midnight of the symbology uh, of, uh, of a lion, link, link the midnight to the symbology of a lion. Um, we're applying to Millerite history, uh, Revelation 10, 1 to 3 states that a mighty angel came down from heaven with his face as it were the sun and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. In this verse, we can also see uh, corresponding symbolism. The cry connects to the time of the midnight cry in 1844, a cry that began when the sun was in the constellation of Leo, and hence a cry as a lion roareth. So Jay and Andrews and other pioneers connected the angel of Revelation 10, verse 1, as coming down on August 11th, 1840. So Andrews writes, the termination of the hour, day, month, and year of the sixth angel marks the conclusion of the second woe, August 11th, 1840, Revelation 9, verse 15. At the close of the sixth angel's voice, uh, a mighty angel descends from heaven to herald the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Now, I would disagree in this here, where you have uh, the testimony of William Foy, who says the seventh trumpet doesn't occur until uh, still sounding at that, till after that time. So uh, he has a little book open in his hand, and he places his hand, right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cries with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. Seven thunders utter their voices, but John is forbidden to write what they utter. So this is talking about uh, this year, time period here, 11th of August, 1840, where Islam is restrained. Uh, we have an angel faced as a sun and a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And then it's going to be a period of 144 or 1,440 days uh, to when the sun is in Leo, and um, we have the Midnight Cry by Samuel Snow. And that's going to be another 93 days then to when the shut door occurs on October 22nd. Um, so just sort of seeing potentially some uh, connecting symbolism there uh, between them. So it is at midnight that God manifests his power for deliverance of his people. The sun appears, shining in its strength, uh, signs and wonders follow in quick succession. The wicked look with terror and amazement upon the scene, while the righteous behold with solemn joy the tokens of their deliverance. Everything in nature seems to turn out of its course. The streams cease to flow. Dark heavy clouds come up and clash against each other. In the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory, whence comes the voice of God, like the sound of many waters, saying, It is done. So we have like a voice, um, we have the song you mentioned there at midnight, sort of uh, sort of similar uh, symbology there. So maybe like Samuel Snow's sort of in some way, and Ezekiel here maybe as well is, is typifying uh, or foreshadowing Christ's second coming. I think it uh, seems like a contradiction there, it's at midnight, like God manifests his power, and then it says the sun appears shining in its strength. Now we know that it's not can't therefore be a literal midnight because the sun is uh, hidden and so it's dark at that their time. So this has a, is a relating to like a, a symbology uh, midnight. So 
we have that there. Four living creatures, San Leo, and then with the clock pointing to midnight. Um, and that uh, symbology. So just some thoughts there. I don't know, maybe it maybe needs time to think about it. Um, just thought I would share that. Um, there is, there was, um, well, Christ's return as well to execute judgment upon the wicked as a lion is symbolized in Isaiah 31 verse 4. For thus saith the Lord spoke, uh, for thus, for sorry, for thus hath the Lord spoken unto me like as the lion and like, uh, sorry, and the young lion roaring on his prey. When a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Zion, for the hell thereof. So there we have uh, the second coming, I believe it's referring to, and uh, Christ is coming as a lion. And we know that it's at midnight, and then at midnight we have the sun and the constellation of Leo. Theodore has already noted these here a period of 666 years uh, from the beginning of the, the siege of Jerusalem there with Jehoiachin reigning and to the destruction of, uh, of Jerusalem. That's 666 years. And you have 36 years in either side of that. Uh, one of the after 36 years when Jehoiachin is released from prison. And then it's uh, from the end of the 70 weeks, it's 36 years to the destruction of Jerusalem. And I've just included here just some seven times. We know that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, just some time before he died, um, was like a madman for seven years. We have the seven, the week of Christ prophecy the last week, seven years being noted uh, <clears throat> Um, just before 34 AD, coming up to that point in time. And then we have the seven times there of a strange being. Uh, Elmite talks about that in Great Controversy, page 30, that for seven years a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Um, sort of uh, giving that warning that the city is about to be destroyed. <clears throat> So we have here, uh, from creation to 1844, this is like a structure that I've identified, and it has a date and span correlations from the flood to 1798, uh, connected to when Ezekiel began his prophesying, uh, being sandwiched between uh, 46 years or its multiple. So from creation uh, to the shut door and flood, um, Usher would agree that it's uh, 16 Hundred and fifty-six years, and this is a uh, forty-six years times thirty-six. It's then going to be seventeen ninety-eight years to when the fifth day of the fourth month, and Ezekiel begins his uh, prophesying, his visions, and then it's going to be uh, two thousand three hundred and ninety years, which corresponds to the date of the flood, to the time of the end in seventeen ninety-eight. Which corresponds with that span, and then it's going to be uh, 46 years, or if you're going to have prophetic days, 46 times 360 is uh, 1,000 or 16,560, which connects to the uh, 1656 years uh, of the Antediluvian period, and we have at the end of that the fifth day of the fourth month. Again, which connects with Ezekiel's fifth day of the fourth month, on the, it's also the 21st of July. And the Gregorian calendar, which corresponds to the 21st of July and Julian. And we also have that year, the shut door, which connects to the shut door at the end of the Luvian, end of the Andalusian period. So that's uh, just some uh, interesting structure that uh, just shows that this is a pivotal date connected to between creation to 1844 to give us your structure. 
And um, also noted uh, the ages of Joseph and Lamech in relation to uh, Jacob and Adam's deaths, uh, after which the years they live in symbol, in two different calendars, both connect to the date of the midnight cry in 1844. So both uh, when Joseph was born and when Lamech was born, they both lived 56 years until someone of significance died. And that was, uh, for Joseph, that was his father. Uh, and then for Lamech, that was Adam. It's then going to be another 54 years that Joseph lives until he dies. And Lamech is going to be in 721 years that he lives until he dies. And I've connected this here with the first day of the first month. The tenth day of the tenth month, we have we have mid, midway, the fifth day of the fourth month. So these here are fifty or four years of uh, that uh, Jacob lived connects with the symbol of the fifth day of the fourth month, and then uh, in, in the uh, Gregorian calendar, that will be uh, July twenty first, and that we can write that as uh, seven twenty one. The American way of writing it, and um, this connects with the 721 years that uh, Lamech lived after Adam died as well. So, I don't know of any other years that you have 50 people living 56 years and then someone dying. In the Bible, this is the only identified part of the play at the sea, and uh, <clears throat> Ezekiel. Uh, when he was predicting on the 50th of the fourth month, the siege, uh, that siege lasted uh, 560 days. So that could even tie in with these here as a symbol. Uh, these 56 years could connect to that. And uh, just another note concerning this year Passover. So it was like if, if you have an inclusive count, uh, to that Passover, it's 31 years. Uh, to when Ezekiel has this here vision of the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, and the song and the constellation of Leo. And then it's going to be 622 years to when uh, Christ is crucified. Um, we read in Revelation that John has a vision of the throne room, and there's a lamb there that's been slain. So you have that there connection uh, of the lion, ox, man, and eagle in that there chapter, in Revelation chapter 4. Now, that would be the, the 19th year of Tiberius. And um, the, 30th, the 30th year, which uh, John is referencing, uh, would begin in the Jubilee of the 19th year of Josiah. So you have a king there, the 19th year, you have the the King of Rome, in a sense, there, the 19th year. So John has this here vision around 90 to 180, but at least in part, it relates to the events in 31 AD that he saw a lamb as it had been slain. Uh, so this is maybe like a slight divergence uh, from the book of Ezekiel, but I'm connecting it in the sense here we have like a wheel within a wheel. And this is a uh, a, a sort of a geoma, geoma, geometry type structure that is quite familiar. It's called a, a vesica piscis, uh, which means a bladder of a fish. And it has been used to find uh, the root of, uh, of the square roots of certain numbers. Uh, for instance, this is this, the square root of number three uh, can, be dis, uh, can be discerned from uh, this here portion, of the center portion of these here two circles. So you have these two circles, and they both uh, meet. And the, the center point uh, would be that this one end of the other. And Archimedes, as a near approximation to obtain that square root, uh, relates 153 uh, to the num. Uh, sorry, what did he do? Sorry, he's he relates. Uh, Oh, sorry, the ratio 1265 to 153 was used by Archimedes as a near approximation 
to obtain the square root of 3. So, uh, so 153 relates to the number of fish in John 20, verse 11, as well, which we know. But also find out that we have here, in these here numbers, 265 and 153, we can connect them to this year, 430 year period from when Abraham left Haran until the Exodus in 1533 BC. And this is divided into two periods of 215 years. Uh, one when God's people sojourned in Canaan, chiefly. We know that Abraham uh, went down into Egypt briefly, but he wasn't he was sent uh, back, sent away by the king there, um, Abimelech. Uh, but generally they're in, in Canaan, or meant to be in Canaan, for 215 years. And then when Jacob and Joseph uh, reunited, then it was 215 years that God's people were in Egypt. And we note four generations uh, during this year first uh, time period. We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And then Exodus chapter 6 gives us uh, four generations from uh, the third time of sojourning in Egypt. We have Levi, Kohath, Amram, and Aaron. And Levi here and Joseph, they overlap in this year time period, so they're both the sons of Jacob. But if you add up the sons of Jacob, uh, it comes to, uh, uh, sorry, if you add up the years that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph lived, of these four generations, it comes to 612. And that, their age then averages out to be 153 years. And if you add up uh, Levi, Kohath, Amram, and Aaron, uh, the years that they lived, uh, it totals up to 530. And if you half that, uh, it comes to 265. So there we have 265 for the length there of that structure and 153 for the width of it. So just uh, thought it was kind of worth noting. Uh, the periods of the kings of Judah, uh, we identify that there's a connection to the 391 years that they reigned to the, the timeline of the fifth trumpet. And it's 391 years and if you add up the three months that Jehoiahaz reigned and the three months and ten days that Jehoiachin reigned at six months and ten days, which is equate to 187 days. And uh, we have at the end of the 391 years and half a month of the prophecy of Revelation 9 verse 15, we have noted there a period of 1,533 days. And towards the end of that, we have the six months and ten days of the, uh, the second angel of when it arrived. So the shut door there. And this year period here, uh, just recently, sort of uh, something interesting. It's the a period of 134 days. So we we'll find out that one, sorry, 1,347 days. Uh, from when that first angel was empowered until the second angel arriving. So uh, the 1347th prime number is uh, 11,117. Uh, 11, so we have four ones and a seven there. Um, the 187th prime number is uh, uh, 1117. So we have like a similar um, numeric aspect there, just an extra 10,000 connected with uh, this year period and prime number. So the Millerite son, Ezekiel. Uh, so Ezekiel in chapter 2, we're moving on to chapter 2, you know, he, uh, in chapter 3, he eats this here little book, and this is quite very much the same symbology that we find in the time of the Millerites. Um, Revelation chapter 10, uh, when that angel comes down, uh, he's, uh, John's given it to, uh, a book to eat, and it's as sweet as honey in his mouth, but it turns out to be bitter in the, in the stomach. 
Um, Ezekiel, he also is his little book, and it's his sweetness is honey. And uh, this there also is within that there 381.5 years. So, but it's not quite at the end as it is with the uh, the Millerites. Uh, the event is sweet because it confirmed prophecy. Um, maybe this uh, could be sweetness to us as it's representing midnight and midnight's Lord's return. So we have, we have that sort of similar uh, idea that uh, Ezekiel is kind of picturing us at the end of the, the world. And uh, we know, so that's just like a, where, so it's not quite at the end as the Millerites and just sort of identifying that it's uh, six years prior to the end of that 381 year period. We have the period there of 390 years mentioned that we get to chapter four. Um, just another uh, diagram that I noted, just sort of connecting these here, uh, 391 years and 187 years. So uh, from when they came out of the Egypt, the Israelites put up a red calf, or sorry, not a, a golden calf, sorry, and then uh, Jer Jeroboam set up two golden calves. Um, but that time period was 556 years. And then it's uh, 391 years to when the temple's destroyed. And then it's going to be destroyed again on the 10th day of the fifth month, 655 years later, in 70 AD by Rome. And uh, when you look at, uh, go back to when uh, Enoch was born, it was 65 years to when uh, Methuselah was born, and then you have 187 years to when Lamech was born, and then it's going to be 56 years to when Adam dies. So we have like a similar here, 556 to 665, sort of sandwiching these 391 years. And here we have 65 and 56 in a sense, sandwiching these 187 years. To me, it's just like uh, suggesting these here, the 191 years and 187 years are connected. And as a hexadecimal, I think it's, um, there's the connect, I think it's 391, the hexadecimal is 187. I think that's how that works, or it could be the other way around. Um, we know 391 years is also a lunar and uh, a lunar and solar cycle. So I have here uh, so a natural cycle of 391 years. The current Roman-based Gregorian calendar in use today throughout most of the world is a solar calendar of about 365.25 days a year. The Islamic world uses a lunar calendar of 12 months, which has about 354 days in each year. And so it falls behind the low solar calendar about 11 days uh, each every year. So it takes 32 years and seven months for a year's difference between the calendars to occur. So that 32 solar years and seven months will equate to 33 lunar years and seven months. This is a period of 11,900 days or about and about 11,000, sorry, um, 1,000. 190 minutes. So it takes until there's a difference of exactly 12 years uh, between the calendars until we can state that solar years differ to the lunar years without any mention of months. So that's what I have here, this year, 12 year difference. So it's going to, till, till it occurs again that there's no months mentioned, it's just 391 years and then it's going to be that's going to equate to 403 solar years. Uh, if you add up these here years, just the months, sorry, of each of the years, just came up to uh, 66. Just uh, thought it was kind of an interesting number. Um, okay, so just a question there. Stephen? Yes, yes, so, speak. So um, so the months there, What is? what are these... So this, okay. is, so this is just the leftover months from yes. every time you, you do this, like it's 33 years and seven months, and then you do it again, it's going to be two months left over because that's just the two months from the 714, right? Is that right. what's happening? Okay. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, you know, it's eleven thousand nine hundred days from when you were born to uh, nine eleven. Yes. Yeah, Which you was... didn't notice, but I did. No. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah. So if you want to know how old Stephen is, just subtract uh, eleven thousand nine hundred days from nine eleven, and uh, you'll get his age. <laughs> yes. So you know, I, I was then. I would be thirty-two years, seven months old the 9-11 or yeah. else I would be 33 lunar years and seven months old the 9-11. Yeah. So so this is a period of um, these 391 years is 1,000, sorry, 142,810 days or 12 times 11,900 days and plus that in minutes. Uh, so this is 1,000 190 days short of 144,000 days, which is the number of days in a, a back tomb of the uh, Mayan, Mayan calendar. So the 391 years prophecy of Revelation 9.15 had been connected to the solar and lunar cycles in the 19th century by the preacher, evangelist and author Henry Grattan Guinness. According to Dr. Walter Ridgway, the most interesting of Guinness's discoveries was that the hour, day, month, and year of Revelation 915 is a solar lunar nautical cycle, calculating this period on the hermeneutical basis of one prophetic day for an historic year. We arrive at the sum of 391.01 years, or with 15 days there. So the discovery of this prophetic period as a solar lunar nautical cycle is original to Henry Grant Guinness of the 40 solar lunar nautical cycles shorter than 3,000 years. 391 years is the most accurate eclipse cycle, embracing a whole number of years in existence. So that's just a reference to what was stated there. Now, Grant Guinness didn't connect that to, um, to Islam, I don't think. No, no, he did. Oh, did he? Um, well, maybe not. Yet. Maybe not. Yeah, yet. but he had a different a different span, right? Yeah. So he he just put it in. A, I can't remember where he put it, but yeah, after I had figured that out, then I found out he had figured it out before me. But uh, yeah. but that's because I looked at the the twenty sixth day of the fourth month, right? In uh, you know, well, on the on the Biblical calendar back in uh, 12, 1299, July 27th, and then in 1449, and then in 1840. So, so once I'd found that out, then I noticed that he had done that too. But he he didn't put them on those dates, right? He I, I can't mm -hmm. remember where he he put the wool, but he did count it as Islam. Is my understanding? Right, okay. Thanks for yeah, that. And, 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 and that's why it's kind of interesting too, because. Um, He's he's looking at that span of time, but he's not actually connecting it with the Islamic calendar, right? So mm -hmm. he's just looking at its connection to the Julian or Gregorian calendar and and the solar year. But then we found also it was a cycle connected with the Islamic calendar. So I don't I don't know of anybody else who figured that out. But but that's the significance of it. Is it it really confirms the prof prophecy of Revelation 9, and also was used to come up to July 18, 2020. Okay, thank you. So further on in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, uh, we have sort of very similar language in uh, Ezekiel 33, 8 to 9. It's talking about uh, saying unto the wicked, you know, to get that warning, at least they die in their sins. <laughs> and um, so I have some Melamite statements uh, in connecting connection with this here uh, passage. I'm just going to ask for some volunteer if they could read the next. Uh, I'll just make it a bit bigger. Read uh, this section for me, please. Are we? Well, go ahead, Ellen. Are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies at the end 
before we say anything concerning them. Of what value will our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith in the word of God? Must we see things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said? In clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read and understand before it's too late. Responsibility for sins we do not reprove. The prejudice which has arisen against us because we have reproved wrongs that God has shown me existed, and the cry that has been raised of harshness and severity is unjust. God bids us speak, and we will not be silent. If wrongs are apparent among his people, and if the servants of God pass on indifferent to them, they virtually sustain and justify the sinner and are guilty alike with the sinner and will receive the displeasure of God just as surely as the sinner, for they will be made responsible for the sins of the guilty. I have been in vision pointed to many instances where the displeasure of God has been incurred by a neglect on the part of his servants to deal with the wrongs and sins existing in their midst. Those men who have excused wrongs have been thought by the people to be very amiable and of lovely disposition, simply because they shunned the discharge of plain and scriptural duty. The task was not agreeable to their feelings, therefore they avoided it. Okay, uh, thank you, Ellen. So we had, uh, when we were given that, uh, in a sense, warning to Nashville, we had this here responsibility. Uh, much of what we were looking at was connected to Ezekiel and uh, these sort of passages we read there very much sort of as uh, we're sort of saying you know, we were to warn people. Uh, so we felt that responsibility uh, to do that there and uh, to, to do not to do more Nashville was, in a sense, uh, it would be, in a sense, bearing the sins of the people when you're not warning. So uh, in verse 21, she says, uh, Ezekiel says, Nevertheless, if I warn the righteous man, and the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. The true people of God, who have the spirit of the work of the Lord, and the salvation of souls at heart, will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of fearful and plain dealing with sins which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000, who are to stand without fault before the throne of God. They will feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of men, which have a slaughter weapon in his hand. Uh, so we can we come to Ezekiel chapter nine later. Uh, so this here, uh, uh, just, could you just unmute yourself, Ron, please? Ron, Ron, yeah, could you unmute yourself, please? Thanks. Um, so. Um, at the end of the 390 days, when Ezekiel lies on his left side, so the last day that he lies on his, on his left side uh, is going to be the 10th day of the fifth month, which is five years before the temple was destroyed. And then when he begins to lie on his right side, it's going to be the 15th of August, 591 BC, which connects to the 15th of August of the Midnight Cry uh, in the Exeter Camp meeting. So, very much the midnight cry symbology uh, we find in, in Ezekiel. So, so Ezekiel's both both way when he turns down, he's, he's both looking back at this year date, the fifteenth of August, uh, five ninety one BC, and um, when he actually uh, receives his next vision, it's on the. Uh, 
the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month. So we find that in chapters, uh, chapter eight, uh, verse one. And this occurs 23 days into when Ezekiel is lying on his right side. And then he has another 17 days left of that, of that 40 day period. And it's just interesting if you multiply 23 by 17, uh, gives us the number 391. This number just comes up again and again. Uh, if you look at the parable of the workers in the vineyard, if you add up the hours, the third hour, sixth, ninth, eleventh hour, now it doesn't give you the twelfth hour, but we know that uh, this would represent the night cometh when no man can work. Uh, if you include that as well, it comes to 41, which would have been if Ezekiel was going to prophesy to the destruction of Jerusalem, rather than to the siege, he would uh, lie on his, each side an extra day. So that would be like uh, 41 days. So that would tie in on that. But if you square these here, hours, uh, these here, so you have three times three would be nine. So the Bible, we know you have 40, uh, the Jubilee cycle, is seven times seven. Uh, we have the 144,000. It's sort of like 12 times 12 connected there as well. So do that there with these here hours. It comes to uh, and add them up. It comes to a total of 391. Which, uh, connect with Ezekiel prophesying to the destruction of Jerusalem. So this year, 15th day of the eighth month, uh, if we take out symbology of uh, 15th of August, uh, we understood this year connects to the beginning of the 390 years we have this year, date of false worship being set up by Jeroboam in 977 BC. Uh, that's going to take us to the, the siege of Jerusalem. And then we have the 15th day of the month being when the midnight cry was given in Exeter in 1844. So just connecting Ezekiel to uh, midnight cry. So another observation is that the prophecy of Josiah occurred on the 15th day of the 8th month of 977 BC. So this is the man from Judah. The prophet from Judah comes to Jeroboam. And this is the 22nd of November uh, in 977 BC. Now, 350 years later, in 627 BC, as uh, the 15th day of the 8th month is also the 22nd of November. Uh, so this year, would be the 627 BC, and it's the only date that has the 22nd of November as the 15th day of the 8th month between 644 and 609 BC, period of 56 years. So kind of quite rare. And then from that date, um, the 22nd of November, to the beginning of the siege on the 10th day of the 10th month, is a period of 39 years, one month, and 15 days, inclusive days, so that would sort of connect with that 391 years and 15 days. So this is what I'm saying here. So this is the beginning of the 40 years, really, would be connected with this year time period that Ezekiel lies on his right side. So you'd have 350 years of the 390. Again, in, in, uh, the 390 begins in 977. And then you have 350 years before the 40 years begin. So this is the 22nd of November. I've just sort of said, not noticing any particular event to this year date. I'm just sort of doing uh, what biblical calendar, just 350 years. Uh, it's the same in the Julian calendar, the 22nd of November. And then it's going to be 39 years, one month and 15 days until that siege begins. So, Stephen, we, we're, we're not really sure exactly when that prophecy of Josiah is, is fulfilled, where in that year it, it is fulfilled, right? No. We just know that it's fulfilled in that year. So, but even, even if it was, let's say it was fulfilled on that date, which we don't have any evidence it was, that would still count as 40 years, just it would be a, uh, um, an ordinal count. Yes. Right, rather than cardinal. Mm -hmm. But whether that's that's the case or not, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, chapter nine. 
and it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Ellen White says, This scripture represents the character of the people of God for, the light, for these last days. The seal of God will be placed upon the forehead of those who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. So, what are the abominations that those who receive the seal of God are to sigh and cry about? Ezekiel chapter 8 mentions four progressively degenerating ab abominations, with the date symbolically expressed as 665, being the sixth year, sixth month, fifth day of the month. Uh, the events described in the book of Ezekiel associated with that date has been understood as representing the time just before the mark of the beast. The 666 of Revelation 13, verse 18. I'll just have like a, a diagram here of these here abominations that we read about in chapter 8. So the first one is this image of jealousy. Uh, it's somewhere around this here, Northgate. I just put it, I guess, here, colored pillar, just as sort of, I don't know what the actual image would look like. And then he has this here vision of these here 70 elders. I think it's this here region where he buries, he goes in through the wall and sees these here 70 elders um, worshipping these here creepy, creepy uh, insects or whatever and animals. And then we have the woman weeping for Tammuz outside this here North Gate as well. And then we have 25 men bowing down to the sun as the final abomination. And that's between the porch and the altar, and they're facing the east, the sun. And so typifying um, basically the leadership at the end of the world that are receiving the mark of the beast. Uh, so Stephen, just a thought here. Um, so we know that Ezekiel is addressing um, Leviticus 26, right? Because he's he's actually announcing the coming of the fourth seven times, right? The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, so these four abominations would relate to that symbolically, right? Because you have the progressive destruction of four, and, and that that also symbolizes that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I never thought of that before, though. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, the image of jealousy. So prior to King Ahaz, the altar would seem to have been placed uh, at the entrance of the house on the east. But Ahaz brought the brazen altar, which was before the Lord, from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar. This would likely have been destroyed when son Zedekiah removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves. So Hezekiah's son Manasseh later built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he set up a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house, which the Lord said to David and Solomon, his son, in the house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, while I put my name forever. His grandson, uh, King Josiah, later destroyed these images and therefore would have to have this here sort of image of jealousy, I'm saying, would have to have been built after Josiah's death. Uh, Josiah brought out the grove from the house of the Lord about Jerusalem onto the brook Kidron and burned it. At the brook Kidron and stamped, stamped it to powder and cast powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. So, um, so there is sort of a mention of an, an altar here. But we also have an altar between the, the porch uh, where the, these here men are, are bowing down. So me, I'm not too sure whether it would be um, two others there, just from what uh, Ezekiel here is telling us. It could have been uh, two. Um, so, uh, relating to the end time application of the deepening apostasy, uh, um, the last abomination typifies an element of the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church conforming to Sunday worship. But we are told that many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out, for dark, go out in darkness. 
In his word, the Lord declared that he would do for Israel if they would obey what he would do for Israel if they obeyed his voice. But the leaders of the people yielded to the temptations of Satan, and God will not give them the blessings he designed them to have, because they did not obey his voice but listened to the voice and policy of Lucifer. This experience will be repeated in the last years of the history of the people of God, who have been established by his grace and power. Men whom he has greatly honoured will, in the closing scenes of this earth's history, pattern after ancient Israel, a departure from the principles Christ has laid down in his teachings, a working out of human projects, using the scriptures to justify a wrong course of action under the perverse working of Lucifer, will confirm men in understanding and the truth they need to keep from wrong practices will leak out of the soul like water from a leaky vessel. She also says, frequent will be the apostasies of men who have occupied responsible positions. Uh, she says, the great issue so near at hand, the enforcement of Sunday laws, will weed out those whom God have not appointed and he will have a pure sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. Um, so we have some statements there concerning the 25 men. Um, El, El, uh, the General Conference Bulletin, not El White, states that uh, the executive committee of this conference shall be 25 in number. And then in 1901, the same year that was writ, El White wrote, Yet we hear that the voice of the conference is the voice of God. Every time I have heard this, I have thought it was almost blasphemy. The voice of the conference ought to be the voice of God, but it is not, because some in connection with it are not men of faith and prayer. They are not men of elevated principle. There is not a seeking of God with the whole heart. There is not a realization of the terrible responsibility that rests upon those in this institution to mold and fashion minds after the divine similitude. Uh, in more recent times, uh, the following letter was dispatched. It says, here at the General Conference, the highest decision-making committee, of course, is a general conference committee. There is a committee that we term general conference officers, which is made up of about 25 or 26 individuals, presidents, secretaries, and treasurers, with a few other invited individuals. This committee is a screening committee that determines the items that need to go to the general conference committee. So, um, Maybe not the highest level, but we, we find there like 25 people being mentioned. So Joel 1 verses 2 to 4, we have that there, four generations being mentioned, and uh, these here insects sort of uh, eating more and more at each, at each uh, generation. So we can connect four generations to that progressive destruction. Um, just for time, not reading Joel 1 to 4. So, therefore, the abomination of Ezekiel chapter 8 can be seen as relating to four generations of Adventism, beginning with the establishment of the church in 1863 until the Sunday Law. The year 1863 saw a new chart being made containing some of the images of the 1843 and 1850 charts with explanations in an accompanying book. These were accompanied with a chart of the law of God. One of the significant uh, previous time prophecies that was not included on the chart was the seven times or 25, 20 years. Uh, the chart was made 19 years, 19 years after the 25, 20 years came to an end in 1844. Higher medicine, higher medicine made an application to the 25, 20 years that related to the Northern Kingdom with a 19 year period, which a 19 year period has been identified prior to its beginning and thus providing a chiastic structure for the two 25-20 periods, one for Israel and the other for Judah. So we're familiar with that. Um, just have a, a quick prayer. And just uh, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we 
ask for your blessing upon the rest of this presentation. Give thanks for the, the truths that you've been revealing to us as we near your soon coming. Pray that we can be faithful stewards with the truth, these your truths that you've given us and you enable us to present them to others in a way which is to your honour and your glory. And we pray for the latter rain, uh, that we can be witnesses for you to, to bring those in darkness into your glorious light. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're dealing with the horrible. And uh, in chapter 9, there's people that have, have seemed to sigh and cry for the abominations done in, uh, in Israel. We're making an application. Okay, what is we are to sigh and cry about? And uh, we've mentioned that uh, these four abominations really at from 1863, the Sunday Law. And the image of jealousy uh, corresponds to this year chart uh, of in 1863 that in a sense set aside the, the, the two inspired uh, charts of Habakkuk's two tables. And uh, we know that El, uh, William Miller had a dream that his jewels would be replaced with spurious ones, be taken out of the, the, the casket and uh, replaced. And uh, the trust that he had would be kind of lost. But the dirt brush man comes in at the end of the world and uh, makes the shine 10 times brighter. And we believe that the 2520, is one of them truths that have been uh, taken out and from the casket and God has been putting it back into place again. Now, there's nothing absolutely wrong with this here, the law of God. You know, that's perfectly good to print out. Um, the 1863 chart, uh, again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's other than the only thing really is it's the sort of... Uh, setting aside of the, the two inspired Habakkuk's two tables. And uh, we can sort of see it as a, a fulfillment um, of, of prophecy in a sense. That, uh, so I have some things concerning us here, 1863 chart. So uh, William James White, he writes that uh, the General Conference by unanimous vote requested the association to publish a new prophetical chart on the chart of the Ten Commandments. If published, it is designed that they shall be better adapted to use before large congregations than the ones which we now have. I should add, by the way, that we have none of the old on hand to supply the present and future demands of the cause. So the other ones, I'm not too sure whether that's uh, the 1850 chart maybe he's mentioning. Um, so Ellen White was seen to be endorsing the 1863 charts. She writes, is your life such as to give it, give you influence at home with your families and workmen? You can hang up the charts and show them the truth as if, as it is illustrated. So she's writing this in 1870. You can teach them uh, if you have a mind thus to do so by explaining prophetic history and tracing down prophecies that the end of all things is at hand. You can impress them with the sacredness of the law of God and show them its claims upon them. So mentioning the law of God there and the chart, uh, the charts would seem to suggest that she's uh, uh, relating to people to using these here. Uh, to, as teaching aids. Uh, Joseph Bates, uh, he initially praised the 1843, six, sorry, the 1863 chart. He says the neatly finished symbols and order of the prophetic chart illustrating so clearly the prophecies of the two great prophetic, two great periods which so strikingly marked the rise and fall of earthly kingdoms and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the glory of his fathers 
of his father. This, with the neatly polished lithograph chart of the law of God, are beautiful pictures to hang side by side in the dwellings of all Seventh-day Adventists. They show at a glance the outlines of their faith and practice with the great Advent movement. He then goes on to connect it to the fulfilment of the prophecy of Isaiah 30, verses 8 to 10. On reading the key of the prophetic chart, which in so few words comprehends the, and most strikingly delineates the pictorial illustrations of the visions of Daniel and John, together with the diagram of the great prophetic period of Daniel's 2,300 days and clear proof of its commencement and also of its termination in the past, I was forcibly impressed to read again what the prophet Isaiah foresaw would be written in a book in the latter day. Here it is. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for a time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Those who are labouring to give the correct view of the prophecies of Daniel and John, including the work of the sanctuary and the third angel's message, as delineated on the prophetic chart or in a table, or very often in the company with the people and the seers which the prophet has herein described. It is well established fact that the prophetic charts have been used to explain from since they were first made on tables in the year 1842. From this period to 1844, the explanation was written on the chart in connection with the symbols one important difference or change has now taken place, which appears to be in harmony with the prophecy, uh, viz, or namely, the symbols are in their appropriate order, written in a table, but without explanation or words noted in a book. Uh, so he says there, compare Isaiah 29, 11 to 12. That says, the vision is all and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of the book that is sealed, which men delivered to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. So now, if it can be shown that the prophetic chart is yet to be amended <coughs> or rewritten, then it is not yet noted in the book named by the prophet. But if the prophetic chart is now correct and subject to no further alteration, but written in a table forever and ever, then is it not clear that it is also noted in a book? So uh, James White responded saying, we are always glad to hear from our venerable brother Bates. It is evident that he loves the Advent doctrine and all connected with it. That has been good. His application of the prophecy of Isaiah to the chart seems to us to be uh, very apocryphal, but it will do no harm unless others make such doubtful exposition of equal importance with plainly revealed vital points of doctrine. Um, now, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, say any other. Um, um, well, Stephen... Yeah. So one of the things that I noted there is that um, both Bates and uh, James White are being playful with each other. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, Bates is hinting at something that, that James White picks up on. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, you know, if you just read it on the surface, you don't quite see it. But you can see that, that Bates... Even though he looks at the chart, it's a good thing. He sees that there is something about this uh, prophecy in Isaiah 62 that is a message to the church at that time. And, and James White picks up on that. that why, that's why he says, you know, well, it, this will do no harm unless others make such doubtful exposition of equal and equal importance with plainly revealed vital points of doctrine. So he sees that Bates is in, in an offhanded way, sort of making a criticism of the chart, even though he's, he's noting the good things about it. 
Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes, but you, you said Isaiah 62. I said what? Isaiah chapter 62. Yeah, it's not chapter 62. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's just a mistake. Which, which chapter is it? <laughs> um, 30? Yeah, 30. 30, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a, a mental slip. I was thinking of um, uh, Hafsaiba for some reason. Just that's the verse that came into my mind. Mm -hmm. That's a different different topic. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Ellen White's or James White's eldest son Henry had died after he slept on the chart. So that's also like a, a not a good sign. It says my mind goes back to Oak Hill Cemetery in Battle Creek, Michigan. I see there two graves. My firstborn son fills the long grave, and next comes a short grave where my Darling babe, my last born, my first died of inflammation of the lungs after a sickness of sickness of eight days, in consequence of thoughtlessly resting his head upon a damp, a pile of damp charts and falling asleep. So maybe it wasn't a a major abomination, but it was just enough to sort of, uh, in a, a prophetic sense start the, the, the ball rolling and then more significant abominations followed we had your ass myth um, sort of saying that uh, her writings were not her her visions were truly inspired but her testimonies were not so that was in the spring of 1883 uh, we'll not read it all uh, this this bit but you know George Butler uh, he wrote or for the Review and Herald, a series of 10 articles on inspiration uh, in which he sought to provide a biblical rationale for the theory of degrees of inspiration. Uh, so he's going to say, for instance, Moses in the words of Christ appeared in the first and highest level, and then the writings and the prophets and apostles, a portion at least of the Psalms in the second level, the historical books in the third level and Proverbs, the Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs in the book of Job, the last and lower, lowest level. And then Butler even rejected some texts as uninspired. So this was the first time such a theory was advanced in an official Seventh-day Adventist publication. There are indications that, there, that it was so influential that some people were prompted to almost completely disregard Ellen White's testimony in the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis. And uh, Ellen White, she uh, wrote, the Lord did not inspire the articles on inspiration. And then she says, to criticize the word of God is to venture on sacred holy ground. No human being should ever pronounce judgment on God's word, selecting some things as inspired and discrediting others as uninspired. She explained that also the testimonies have been treated in the same way, but God is not in this. And then we had the rejection of the, the message in 1888. Uh, just for, for time, just she says, uh, just she's, the opposition in our own ranks has imposed upon the Lord's messengers a laborious and soul trying task. The Spirit of God has been present in power among his people, but it could not be bestowed upon them because they did not open their hearts to receive it. They knew not that God had sent these young men to bear a special message to them, which they treated with ridicule and contempt. To accuse and, to, and criticize those whom God is using is to accuse and criticize the Lord who has sent them. The prejudices and opinions that prevailed in Minneapolis are not dead by any means. The roots have never been eradicated. They still bear their unholy fruit to poison the judgment, pervert perceptions and blind the understanding of those with whom you connect in regard to the message and the messengers. So uh, another abomination we can maybe relate to the, the pantheism. Uh, crisis. Uh, Elmite says, I was instructed 
upon some points regarding the work at Battle Creek. In the night season, I was in a large meeting. Dr. Kellogg was speaking, and he was filled with enthusiasm regarding his subject. His associate physicians and ministers of the gospel were present. The subject upon which he was speaking was life and the relation of God to all living things. In his presentation, he cloaked the matter somewhat, but in real reality, he was presenting scientific theories which are akin to pantheism, as of the highest value. One by my side told me that the evil angels had taken captive the mind of the speaker. Dr. Kellogg has been studying these matters for a long time and has been preparing himself to present his ideas and to lead souls to adopt them. And that was the um, alpha of apostasy, and we know there's going to be an omega. We have the changing of the daily uh, with uh, W. W. Prescott, and uh, we have this here book that was written by him by Gilbert M. Valentine, called W. W. Prescott: Forgotten Giant of Adventism's Second Generation. So, if we're going to, uh, this would sort of seem to suggest what abomination period we're now into that of the secret chambers. Uh, just by Gilbert Valentine, what he's saying there, second generation, identifying part of the, the fourth, the, the four generations. Um, so uh, we should be quite familiar of, of that there. I don't think there's any need to, to go into detail how that uh, came about. So they began to, to change the, the understanding that the daily represented paganism and uh, Prescott was relating it to Christ's high priestly ministry and uh, from the 1919 conference uh, many prominent church leaders including A.G. Daniels uh, accepted uh, Conradi's view <clears throat> um, so that gradually became dominant teaching in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and a uh, statement here, Desmond's, Desmond Ford was Adventism's most notable scholar to have followed Conradi's view of the daily, resulting in his ultimate rejection of the sanctuary doctrine as the central pillar of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ford's scholarly arguments swept away uh, numerous Adventist ministers and bright lights. So that was from the Ministry of the Daily by John Peters, what he uh, connects what happened there with Ford uh, to this year change of the daily. A uh, stark warning to the church was given by Ellen White in 1903. She says the principles of truth that God and his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded or religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the, for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. 1915, she wrote, I am charged to tell our people that they do not realize that the devil has device and device, and he carries them out in ways that they do not expect. Satan's agencies will invent ways to make sinners out of saints. I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, rest, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken. And I shall desire to warn all against the devices of the devil. I want the people to know that I warned them fully before my death. In 1957, we have a uh, book, Questions on Doctrine. Uh, the ML, uh, ML Andreasen wrote letters to the churches in the autumn of that year and uh, expressed his view of what had been occurring in the church leadership and that they were seeking to change previous church teachings, one being on the nature of Christ, uh, that Christ was exempt from inherited passions and pollutions that corrupted the natural descendants of Adam. Ellen White, she wrote, God has permitted his son to come a helpless babe, subject to the weakest weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's pearls in common with every human soul to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it, at the risk of failure and eternal loss. 
Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of his degradation. Um, the section there of what Adrian wrote was going on. Um, would someone like to read that for me, please? I can read this. So you want me to read this whole section? Um, like it's going to go on? See. Okay, so there's going to be... Okay, yeah, I can read all that. Um, Do you need it all? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Andreessen writes, here is the story of how these new doctrines found their way into the denomination, as reported by Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. It was decided that Mr. Martin should undertake research in connection with Seventh-day Adventism. Mr. Walton, Walter Martin was at that time a candidate for degree with the editorial staff of Eternity, that's Eternity Magazine. Wishing to get first-hand and reliable information, Mr. Martin went to Washington to the Adventist headquarters where he got in touch with some of the leaders. The response was immediate and enthusiastic. Walter Martin immediately perceived that the Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal positions which they had, had been previously attributed to them. Chief among these were the question of the mark of the beast, and the nature of Christ while in the flesh. Mr. Martin pointed out to them that in their bookstore adjoining the building in which these meetings were taking place, a certain volume published by them and written by one of their ministers categorically stated the contrary to what they were now asserting. The leaders sent for the book, discovered that Mr. Martin was correct, and immediately brought this fact to the attention of the general conference officers that the situation might be remedied and such publications be corrected. This concerned particularly the doctrine of the mark of the beast, one of the fundamental doctrines of the Adventist church held from near its beginning. When the leaders discovered that Mr. Martin was correct, they suggested to the officers that the situation be remedied and such public, um, whoops, um, that such publications be corrected. This was done. We are not informed which publications were so remedied and corrected, nor if the authors were notified before the changes were made, nor if the duly appointed book committee was consulted, nor if the book editors of the publishing house were agreeable to the changes. We do know, however, that in the Sabbath school lessons for the second quarter of 1958, which dealt with the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter, the 13th chapter, which discusses the mark of the beast was entirely omitted. Chapter 12 was there, so was chapter 14, but there was no chapter 13. The Sabbath school lessons had evidently been remedied and corrected. Okay, thank you, Theodore. Um, changing the teaching of the first beast of Revelation 13 to something other than the Roman Catholic Church. So the second uh, volume of Symposium on Revelation, published as part of Daniel and Revelation Study Committee series in 1992, contains a chapter, The Saints' End Time Victory Over the Forces of Evil by William G. Johnson. Uh, he says that um, then the editor, he was the editor of the Advent uh, Review and a formerly uh, professor of New Testament studies at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. In this chapter, he stated, to interpret the sea monster of Revelation 13 as the papacy seems somewhat out of keeping with the spirit of the times. In an age when Christianity is, in general, faces onslaughts of secularism, and when Christian ecumenism has become popular, the interpretation now, what um, the interpretation the interpretation now, what interpretation he has taught, is that maybe? <laughs> anyway, he says he is talking about the inspiration, interpretation smacks of narrowness. Um, 
All right. The interpretation now, what interpretation is he talking about? The interpretations, I, don't know, I think I've made a mistake here somewhere. So anyway, he says it's basically to say that the the base of Revelation 13, to say that's a papacy, it says it smacks of narrowness and bigotry. So this statement would then rebound upon Ellen White and also the Spirit of God that inspired her as being narrow-minded and a, a bigot, basically. Sorry about that. Uh, I might have to sort of look into that statement. And then we have uh, the statement of General uh, Neil C. Wilson, who in an oath of court uh, said that although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the domination took a distinctly anti-Catholic viewpoint, and the term hierarchy was used in a prerogative sense to refer to the papal form of church governments, governance. That attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among the conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this, this, this century and the latter part of the last, which has now been consigned to a historical trash heap so far as the Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. Yeah, that sounds like Parminder. Yeah, you could say that also, yes. Um, then we have, I'm not, we'll not read it, we have the spiritual formation um, being brought in in September 2001. So um, it talks about disciplines of meditation and so forth which uh, connects to uh, Agnesius, uh, what do you call him? <laughs> Loyola, um, to some level. And then we have uh, abortion. Uh, since 1970, the church's healthcare establishments have provided elective abortions. We'll not read it, but there's an article there in the Washington, Washington Post where people were protesting about this here hospital that they're wanting to build, that they let the Adventists uh, put it up rather than the Catholics uh, because the Adventists uh, provide abortions uh, rather than the Catholic University wouldn't have done that. People were uh, protesting that, that this year um, wasn't going to the Catholic Church, whatever. Uh, then we have the vaccine mandates uh, not being a liberty of conscience matter. Now, uh, Ellen sent me some things there of uh, Conrad Vine, where he states that uh, the church was saying that it's not a, a liberty of conscience matter, that the, uh, that the mandates, you know, that it's... Um, Maybe I should just read it. So during the government vaccine mandates in 2021, the church leadership denied its members that objected to the mandates its support to do so on the basis of liberty of conscience. This resulted in many having to either get the vaccine or lose their job. The official church statement uh, stated, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in consultation with the health ministries and public affairs and religious liberty departments of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is convinced that the vaccination programs that are generally being carried out are important for the safety and health of our members and the larger community. Therefore, claims of religious liberty are not used appropriately in objecting to government mandates or employer programs designed to protect the health and safety of their communities. So when this, the FDA approved the emergency use of the vaccination, it had acknowledged that there was no evidence that the vaccine would prevent transmission. However, the church also parroted the lies of Tony Fauci and others. So that resulted uh, in many people losing their jobs. And uh, during the, the previous uh, conference, in Indiana, uh, they deceived the people there at that conference and saying that it wasn't a legitimate topic to bring up and um, basically uh, lied to the congregation there that uh, that 
the, something that was valid that could have been brought up to be spoken about. They just didn't want to speak about it. So the time of God's visitation during the fourth abomination, which is connected to the fourth generation of the time of God's visitation, speaking to Abram concerning the offspring coming out of Egypt, the Lord has said, the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. This is typifying the time during the fourth Adventism, the fourth generation of Adventism, when God will make a, a new covenant with his church triumphant. So, well, just in, a, in an idea, you could sort of see that the fourth generation is a time when um, iniquity is full. That's what I'm just trying to bring out there. Um, so there's other abominations here. I I've, I've just sort of have mentioned these things. So uh, what I would like to ask you, if you could help me with further abominations of what we are to say and cry about that I can put into this year's study of Ezekiel chapter 8. Um, now, I have, uh, there's others I can maybe put in, such as the, the metal that Beach, uh, Birdie Beach, I think his name is, that or BB Beach, that he gave to the Pope. So things they got there, I can maybe put in. But if you have any others, uh, you would maybe think that these are things that we should be saying and crying about. Maybe the, the health uh, care being accredited or the education system being accredited is not our thing. I can maybe add to that. If you've any studies, you can maybe send me on that there. I'll be helpful that I could look into to maybe add um, to that. Uh, so I have a statement there concerning Ezekiel 9, uh, concerning the little children. I'll, I'm not uh, going to that. It's just it's quite a, a solemn message for those who uh, have with children, just to bring them up in the, the fear of the Lord. Um, chapter 1 and chapter 10 of Ezekiel is, is quite similar. So I have here uh, aligned them where you can uh, sort of see similarities in the two chapters. Um, well, just, uh, someone maybe want to read these here, statements concerning Ezekiel chapter 9 and 10. The world would not be what it is now is if professed believers in Christ were receivers of his divine nature. It is the example of men who claim to believe the truth, but who do not practice the truth that detracts from the influence of Christianity. They hold the truth as a theory, but unrighteousness surely characterizes the course of action. Many occupy high positions of responsibility and yet reveal that they are far away from Christ because they are destitute of Christianity. Please read the ninth and 10th chapters of Ezekiel, should we not seek to understand the work which God requires us to do. Its results are sacred and awful. I slept late, I slept little last night. I was taken from company to company, bearing a decided testimony in regard to the men who are spoken of in Ezekiel 9. This was given me to speak upon. I also spoke upon chapter 10. My son, move very carefully. Take Christ's yoke and learn of him. He invites all who will take he, he invites all who will to take his yoke. Learn of me, he pleads, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There will be no darth of matter to print, but there is another question involved. I cannot advise you to the remain. I cannot advise you to remain in Nashville with the present company associated together who are so determined to introduce this evil leaven in the meal. We have but little time to work. The judgment of God are in our land and there are places where your message given you of God will be received. But look to the Lord now with all your being. Okay, thank you, Dean. So this is uh, Ellen White. I think she's writing to... Uh, her son Edson. Uh, I think I have a reference here. It was wrote in the uh, 31st of December 1902. So she's, I think it's Edson she's writing to, saying, uh, 
there's something going on there which is not good. And he's saying, don't get out of Ash, get out of Nashville. Um, and then she quotes, uh, she says, she was speaking on Ezekiel chapter 9. She also spoke, spoke on uh, chapter 10 of Ezekiel as well. And uh, if we read, uh, so chapter 10, the section here called The Glory of the Lord Leaves the Temple. Um, first one says, Then I looked and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as appearance of the likeness of a throne. Again, we see the sapphire stone representing the sky, as well as the law of God, and the cherubims, the stars, constellations, and time. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and shine and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in, in my sight. Um, so in the previous uh, quote that we read, it was written in late 1902, Elle White had written to her son Edson, relating that she had been speaking in Ezekiel chapters 9 and 10. She then advised her son not to remain in Nashville. In the above verse, we see a command for coals of fire to be scattered over Jerusalem. From the time of writing the letter, less than two years later, she had a vision of a ball of fire hitting Nashville. It says, when I, came, when I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people in the night season, and there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected. They said we expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. We knew it, they said. Uh, said they, you knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they had never told them or given them any warning at all. So to me, this is kind of like a, sort of hinting of that, uh, that she's mentioned this here, coals of fire being scattered over the city and then saying to her, her son, to get out of Nashville so maybe it's not obvious but I'm just sort of a, sort of to me there's like hinting of something there it's not maybe totally clear but I just thought it was uh, interesting so verse 2 has connotations of Revelation 8 verse 5 which precedes the sounding of the seven trumpets the first the first four of which have been understood mainly to apply to Gothic tribes that brought down Western Rome and Empire in the 5th century. Uh, so the angel took the censer, filled it with fire off the altar and cast it onto the earth. And there were voices, thunderings, lightnings and an earthquake. So we know later on that Islam is connected with them uh, trumpets as well. And then moving on to chapter 11, uh, we have... Uh, where it says, Then did the cherubims lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the Lord of Israel was over above them, was over, over, over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east of the city. So El might comments on this here. So this is the, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory, that is in the temple. In the, towards the end of the reign of Zedekiah, and it's going to move from the that, the, the temple, and it's going to uh, go into the mountain on the east of the city, which we understand is the Mount of Olives. So uh, Elmai talks about this. She says, uh, "Desire of Ages," as the place of his ascension. And Jesus chose the spot so often hallowed by his presence while he dwelt among men, not in Mount Zion, the place of David's city, not on Mount Moriah, the temple site, was thus to be honoured. There Christ had been mocked and rejected. 
their waves of mercy still returned in a stronger tide of love, have been beaten back by hearts as hard as rock. Since Jesus, weary and heartburned, had gone forth to find rest in the Mount of Olives, the Holy Shekinah, in departing from the first temple, had stood upon the eastern mountain as if to loathe to forsake the chosen city. So Christ stood on the Olivet with yearning heart overlooking Jerusalem. Uh, then we just go on about the groves and glens, consecrated with his prayers and so forth. It just goes on about so uh, just uh, identifying that El Might's talking, identifying that this year she kind of already uh, left the temple uh, just before it was destroyed. Um, the, this event of the departing glory from the temple likely occurred during the time of the siege in either 587 or 586 BC. It could also be related to the removal of the Ark of the Covenant from the most holy place, as it was above the Ark that the Shekinah abode. Ellen White places this during the 18 month siege, but also during a time when the Egyptian host had threatened the Babylonian armies, causing them to temporarily suspend the siege. Uh, there she talks about that. In the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, Nebuchadnezzar came. And then um, among the righteous still in Jerusalem, to whom had been made plain the divine purpose, there were some determined to place upon them the reach of ruthless bands, the sacred ark containing the tables of stone. <clears throat> well, she mentions there uh, the, the Egyptians had endeavoured to come to rescue them. So it was during that their time that the, the ark was secreted in a cave where it was to be hidden uh, from the people of Israel and Judah because of their sins and was to be no more restored to them. That ark is yet the the sacred, that sacred ark is yet hidden. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. Um, so in, in chapter 12 of Ezekiel, yeah, which we've identified as connected to chapter 8, which is the sixth year, sixth, well, sixth, sixth year, sixth month, on fifth day, he's then going to move into the next day with a, a prophecy that relates to Zedekiah's captivity, where Isaiah is fleeing from the uh, Babylonian armies. Uh, so that goes on. So in, in, he's sort of going on this year next day by sort of symbolizing taking the stuff out of his house, um, going out and out of his house, bearing, I think he digs through a hole in the wall of his house or something, as well to take the stuff out. And that's sort of typifying Zedekiah going through the, the, the walls of Jerusalem and trying to depart with a lot of his uh, goods. Um, so that was five years prior to that actually taking place. And then it was six years before um, when the captivity of Jehoiakim took place. And then it's going to be 655 years to when the destruction of Jerusalem takes place, uh, which is a period of 656 years from that, that there. So I'm just sorry, no sign, lots of six fives basically there. It's nothing really majorly symbolic here, but just that. Uh, so I mention it. Um, chapter 13, it mentions about uh, foxes in the deserts. Um, these foxes are typifying false prophets. So uh, just for sake of time, um, just move on just, uh, to chapter 14. We maybe, if we get time, we can maybe come back to that. Um, so in chapter 14, it mentions Noah, Job, and Daniel. Uh, I have several passages here. I'll just maybe read a, a shorter one, the last one there, at least. Um, maybe someone could read that last chapter there for me, please. Or uh, 
paragraph. Moses understood that there was to be a judgment day when every man would be judged according to the deeds done in the body. We each have a case pending at the bar of God. And although Noah, Job, and Daniel were in the land, they could not save son or daughter. They could only save their own soul by their righteousness. It is an individual work for you and me. There will be every attraction to draw us away from Christ's righteousness, and the human heart is inclined to selfish gratification. Every soul who seeks righteousness will meet with perplexities, but shrink not at reproach or trial. Jesus was reproached by the sons of men, and can those of his household expect a better portion? There is help for everyone who in humble faith seeks it. When you put all your powers to the stretch that you may become acquainted with God, you will have this power added to your weakness. Every soul that enters through the gates into the city will go in as a conqueror. There is no sickness, no sighing, no death, but everlasting joy throughout the cycles of eternity. I want to be there, for my soul is attracted to Jesus. Everything here is of minor consequence. Okay, thank you, Ellen. So, um, and, uh, hello, someone saying something? <laughs> so, uh, Ezekiel mentions that Noah, Daniel, and Job, and um, from is that on Ezekiel, he's prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, which um, the temple was destroyed on the 10th day of the 5th month in uh, 586 BC. And if you do from 586, um, an inclusive count of 130 years, it takes you to the 10th day of the 5th month in uh, 457 BC, where we have Ezra uh, leaving Babylon to come to Jerusalem and have the, the, the decree of Artaxerxes. And that 10th day of the 5th month is, can be identified as being between two periods of 130 days from when he first left Babylon until the 20th day of the ninth month to where we have uh, the, the, degree, the decree being executed with the, uh, the law separating from strange wives. And um, in that there year of 457, we can identify a period of 120 days from when Ezra left Babylon to when he arrived in Jerusalem. We can identify from then that it's going to be another 140 days to the 20th day of the ninth month and the decree being executed. And in the midst of that, Ellen White says that the decree went forth in the autumn. Uh, and the midpoint then is uh, the 10th day of the seventh month, which begins at 2,300 years which ends in 1844 so we have a period of 70 days from when Ezra arrived in Jerusalem until that uh, decree uh, went into effect now with these here days we can associate in years Noah Daniel and Job so when Noah he was a uh, given 120 years to build the ark. Get that from Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 and 8. Uh, Daniel can be associated with a period of uh, 70 years where he would uh, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years. Daniel 9, verse 2. And then 140 years connects with 140 days, where Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his son's sons even four generations. And uh, with each of these here uh, names, uh, we can associate three others that can be uh, associated with them. So Noah, he had Japheth, Shem and Ham. Daniel had his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
and then Job has, has three comforters. And then Elmay says, the time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us, and shall we need and we shall need an experience which we do not yet we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. Though Noah, Daniel and Job were in the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall deliver, they shall but deliver their own souls by righteousness. So a familiar quote that uh, we should be familiar with in a sense. But uh, there we have Noah, Daniel and Job connected to it. Um, so we have periods of the 10th day, the fifth month being significant in Ezekiel. So when he, he uh, the last day of his prophesying on his left side, and then he has a prophecy in the and chapter 20 begins on the 10th day of the fourth, fifth month. So this is four years before the temple was destroyed, 586 on that day. And then it's going to be 655 years later when the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. So uh, we understood that in the Julian calendar, July 18 was also that their date. Um, could someone read the next? Uh, quotation from Elmite concerning I think this is Ezekiel 21 verse 6 the history of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves knew not the meaning speaks to us to every nation and to every individual of today God has assigned a place in his great plan Today, men and nations are being measured by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny, and God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. The history which the great I Am has marked out in his word, united, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the pro procession of the ages and what may be expected to come to, expected in time to come all yes. that prophecy has foretold has as coming to pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order the final overthrow of all earthly dom dominions is plainly foretold in the word of truth, in the prophecy uttered when sentence from God was pronounced upon the last king of Israel is given the message. Thus says the Lord, remove the diam and take off thy crown. This shall not be. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and obeys him that is high. I could trim. I could. Okay, uh, thank you, James. Uh, the word diadem is the same used, same word used for mitre of the high priest. And then it says in verse 27, I will overturn, overturn it. So I overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he who comes who write it is, and I will give it him. So the crime was removed from Israel passed successively to the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. God says, it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. That time is at hand. Today the signs of the times declare that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Everything in our world is in an agitation. Before our eyes is fulfilling the Saviour's prophecy of the events to precede his coming, you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Ellen White then says, these words were written nearly 600 years before Christ's first advent. So speaking of Ezekiel's prophecy, says, so it would be actually, uh, it would be 586 years to be more precise. The diadem was in a sense removed from Zedekiah in 586 BC. So here we have uh, 590 BC and the prophecy of the removal of the diadem. And then I'm gonna, it's going to be 586 years till he come whose right it is. And we have the birth of Christ in the 4 BC. Uh, so we have here the diadem, diadem actually being removed from Zedekiah four years after Ezekiel's prophecy. So we have here 586 years as a span and a date, and then four years as a span and also the date with the birth of Christ. Um, this is just illustrating the 390 days and 390 years that uh, Ezekiel was predicting. Uh, that is, the, the siege comes, uh, occurs then. Um, it's a period of 1629 days from when it was first prophesied that it would occur. And if you add that to the 390, I had done a presentation previously where I added both of these here together, it comes to 2019. And I'm suggesting that uh, that they're connected 2019 to the, the siege. We had the world beginning to, uh, was, that was, you had the COVID-19 taking place then, and then that was followed by lockdowns. We had, in a sense, the siege occurring uh, soon after 2019. And 1629 was very much a, a number that Adelio brought up in his prophecy concerning the pandemic. Um, so it just seemed to tie in with that. And in that siege, there was a time when Egypt came and then the siege in a sense was lifted. But then when the Babylonians came back, the, that was, there was no escape then for those still in Jerusalem. Uh, so typifying, I think, suggesting anyway, that we are now in a time when the, in a sense that siege is lifted, but there's going to be a time coming when the sieges are going to occur and then it's there's not going to be this here freedom in a sense uh, after that. That's uh, just an application that I made. Um, so just time-wise, just to try to wrap up quickly. Um, in chapter 25 of Ezekiel, we have a, a message to Ammon, Moab, and to Adam. And uh, Ezekiel is dumb to speaking to Israel at that their time. And um, so the temple is going to be destroyed on the fifth, tenth day of the fifth month in uh, 586. And it's going to be 144 days later that on the fifth day of the tenth month, where this here escapee comes from the city of Jerusalem and comes to Ezekiel. And thereafter, he's going to speak again to to Israel. As he's no longer dumb. So uh, you have here that message then in that time time period, or even well, as actually he was dumb before the destruction of Jerusalem. But you have that message ongoing at this year time of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, where Ezekiel is going to prophesy to them nations. And um, if we go to like a and so this escapee, he's going from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, at the end of the world, we're going to be calling people from spiritual Babylon to, in a sense, spiritual Jerusalem. The 144,000 are is parallel with these 144 days. And we have the Sunday law, and people are going to escape from uh, Babylon into the spiritual Jerusalem. I mean, I understand that Daniel. 11 verse 41 talks about 
Edom, Moab, and Ammon shall escape the hand of the papacy at the Sunday law. And this is like a, a mirror here of uh, what we find read in uh, Ezekiel 25, where we have Ammon, Moab, and Edom. So that's being mirrored. We have the 10th day of the 5th month, uh, when Jerusalem, the temple is destroyed in Jerusalem, being mirrored with the 5th day of the 10th month, when this year escapee arrives in Babylon uh, to tell people, to inform Ezekiel that the temple was destroyed. So, and then 144 days then typify the 144,000. So, uh, just a diagram there. Just, uh, uh, when we get to Ezekiel 27, I've just lined up some of the language there we find compared to Revelation 18. We have all these here uh, merchandise and similar language, gold, silver. So uh, Tyre here is uh, typifying Babylon at the end of the world or the papacy. Um, that sort of diagram there sort of says that Tyre will be forgotten according to the days, 70 years according to the days of one king, which would be Babylon. And Babylon there is typifying the one is. Uh, USA, and at the end, then 70 years, Tara was saying as a harlot, and uh, then we have the Sunday law at the USA, that is when the time, when the papacy will uh, again, again, like sing as a harlot. So some words there about Ezekiel 36, about a new heart. Uh, just, this isn't really to do with Ezekiel, but uh, just I'll let you know about this here. Uh, Theodore had discussed in one of his presentations about an event that took place uh, in, um, in the 25th of May, 2017. We had there the dedication of the Berlin Wall on September 11th, 2001 Memorial uh, at the new NATO headquarters in Brussels. And this is the event here we have here the, the part of the Berlin Wall. Uh, it's interesting there's two like, two blocks there. It reminds me of the two tables. And then we have here part of the girders from the, the Twin Towers. Um, the way this is sort of laid out, it's like a mirror. You see like a line down the middle. And we know that event occurred on the November the 9th. So 11.9, and we know this occurred on September 11th. So we have like a, you can even mirror the dates there in connection with that. And uh, just like a close up there, you had Angela Merkel sort of initiating the ceremony for the memorial for the um, for the Berlin Wall. And then Donald Trump, he was there. Uh, USA representing USA for the the twin towers. So we have here these here two prophetic events, which we identify um, with the repeat of the first angel's message arriving in 1989, and then the empowerment at the restraint of Islam at 9/11, and also that's sort of being combined with the second angel arriving. At the fall of the current towers as well. So they, we have two significant prophetic events being uh, commemorated in this year uh, ceremony. Uh, and a sort of uh, thing that this year was the fifth day of the 20th, the 25th day of the fifth month, in the sense that's like May 25 uh, in the Gregorian calendar. And then it would be 2,300 days until September 11th. Uh, 2023, so that's year year, and then that was the 25th day of the second month in the Islamic calendar. So you can maybe, in a sense, see like a 777 there if you were to combine that sort of imagery in symbolic form. But right in the middle of that is the 26th day of the fourth month and biblical calendar being 18th of July 2020. So you have 1150 days either side of that. And um, 
it's then 22 years or 264 months, sort of uh, connecting with the 26th day of the fourth month there, to September 11th, uh, 2001. It's also uh, commemorating the invoking of Article 5 of uh, this year NATO, um, when it was signed in 1949, there was a, an article that hadn't been invoked prior to this year that when one nation is attacked, the other nations will, will help out. And that was the only time it was has ever been invoked. That was 23 days then after the attacks of the Twin Towers. Um, I just had the idea to align it with the 22 years with Joseph. This year uh, from September 11th, 2001 to this year coming September 11th. Uh, we know that uh, Joseph, he was sold to the Ishmaelites. Uh, and then it was going to be 22 years then before he reunited with uh, Jacob. So you have that connection there with Ishmaelites with Islam on September 11th. And if you go back further 11 years, uh, this is when Jacob makes a peace with Esau. So this is when Jacob uh, leaves Laban and goes back to Canaan and uh, wrestles with Christ. You have that event as well, uh, where he um, be, becomes, takes the name Israel. And um, September 11th it takes you back, uh, 11 years then, will take you back to the George Bush New World Order speech uh, in the wake of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. So you, you do have Islam as well, sort of connected there. And then there was a Helsinki summit taking place just a few days prior to uh, Bishop's speech, we have that uh, King of the South aspect 1989 uh, connection there. So that's like, in a sense, they're kind of making peace with uh, or with the USSR at that time. Um, so don't know what, just uh, put that together, just sort of uh, connecting it. So Jacob, or sorry, Joseph, he was six then when uh, Jacob left. Um, so when Jacob, when Joseph was born, then that would you go back into 1984, and then that would be the time when uh, there was an ambassador from Reg Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican at their time. So I don't know, just some thoughts. Um, but that's that's well. Hang, do you have? Well, let me just close off with. Uh, A final talk about uh, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. It says, when the message of truth is presented in our day, there are many who, like the Jews, cry, show us a sign, work us a miracle. Christ wrought no miracle at the demand of the Pharisees. He wrought no miracle in the wilderness in answer to Satan's insinuations. He does not impart to us power to vindicate ourselves or to satisfy, satisfy the demands an unbelief of unbelief and pride. But the gospel is not without a sign of its divine origin. Is it not a miracle that we can break the bondage of Satan? Enmity against Satan is not natural to the human heart. It is implanted by the grace of God. When one who has been controlled by a stubborn wayward will is set free and yields himself wholeheartedly to the drawing of God's heavenly agencies, a miracle is wrought. So also when a man who has been under strong delusion comes to understand more with truth. Every time a soul is converted and learns to love God and keep his commandments, the promise is fulfilled. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. The change in human hearts, the transformation of human characters is a miracle that reveals a never living saviour working to rescue souls. A consistent life in Christ is a great miracle. In the preaching of the word of God, the sign that should be that should be manifest now is, and always is the presence of the Holy Spirit to make the word a regenerating power to those that hear. This is God's witness before the world of the divine mission of his Son. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, give thanks for your mercies towards us. Give thanks that we've been able to meet together via Zoom uh, to share this presentation. And uh, we pray that you may 
honour you this Holy Sabbath day and know your blessing. Uh, we give thanks for the precious promises of uh, that you've given in your word that, uh, that through dwelling in your son that we can have life, peace and uh, joy uh, throughout eternity. Let us hold fast to your promises and to be obedient to you in all things and we ask your measures, a great measure of your spirit to enable us to do this. Um, we give thanks for all that you're your as the light that you've given us your movement and and we pray that uh, we can be reflective of your character and all we do and say we ask these things in Jesus name amen